Word tonight. We want to be changed and transformed by it. It doesn't matter if we've been studying this or we're just being introduced to this topic tonight. Your Word is your Word. And there's nourishment and there's cleansing and there's healing and there's power in it. So we all ask you to transform us tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. All right, before we go on, please take out a piece of... Oh, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a piece of paper to, to use. Although there's not much room on it. I don't know if there's enough, Josh. This is the study sheet, New Jerusalem 4.6. You do not have this yet. Do not bother looking in your notes for it. You don't have it because I just made it today. And this is going to involve a recap of some of the past elements that we didn't quite nail down yet, in addition to some new stuff as well. But before we do that, we are going to review our Hebrew. Amen? Okay, so Hebrew, first of all, and we're going to be using this tonight. Okay? Somebody tell me what that is. Alif. Bet. Daryl, which one is this? He's the one that caught it last time. Gimel, yes? Okay. Anybody remember what that one is? Dalet. Okay, so please write three of each of these. Again, Alif is a straight slash. And there's one here. And there's one here. Bet. It's kind of like playing hangman. But it's got the t look in the middle. Vet. Just does not have the t -lick. This is almost like a sloping seven. And then this comes out of it. Looks like a teepee in the wind, I guess. This really is a hangman's thing. Al leaf, bet, vet, gimel, and daylit. And then hay, vav, and zayin. Please write three of those. This is all in review, of course. And you're going to have to use them in a minute because you're going to have a tiny little quiz. A quizzy. It's not really a quiz. It's just a quizzy. You know the difference between a quiz and a quizzy? You don't have to turn a quizzy in. Okay? Het. Vav. Zayin. Oh, that's a hey, sorry. Hey. And now it's the het. Yep. Het. This one's closed. That one's open. Het. Say that with me. Het. Tav. And yod. Het. Tav and yod. This is a hey, vav, zayin. Het. Tav. Yod. And last time we learned mem. Mem, that's right. Mem, first version of mem. And this, final mem. Oh, no, we didn't learn mem yet, did we? No, 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 that's right, that's right. I'm wrong, I'm wrong, you're right. We did not learn mem, we learned kaf. We're supposed to learn mem tonight. That's in, not even the right order. Cough. Okay. Actually, that's not right. Cough is kind of like daylit, only it's shorter. There you go. Okay, so I want you to remember all of these, and here's your quizzy part. Ready? And I need my, actually, I need my phone. Just because I take mine out doesn't mean you can take out yours.
Okay, and using this transliteration, Alif for an A, Bet for a B, Vet for a V, Gimel for a G, Dalet for a D, Hey for an H, uh, 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 Vav for a V, Zayin for a Z, Chet will be a CH, Tav, Yod, and Kaf. I want you to write me the word, let's see. Write me the word bag. We're going to write five three-letter words and five four-letter words. Bag. Write gym, like in gymnasium. Um, why don't you just draw, write it straight this time? Although that's a great that's a great question because Hebrew is supposed to be back uh, is supposed to be right to left. So this would be although straight across would be this. If you were to really transliterate it correctly, it would be written like this. But let's do this one for tonight. Bag, gym, oh, let's do this. Gay, bad. Okay, good. Yeah, yes, that's right. Yoda's right here. Tiny little one up there. Let me see yours, Jojo. Uh huh. Okay, no, that's all right. Okay, try um, Jim. Oh, that's right. We didn't do Mem yet. Never mind. Scratch Jim and do uh, Gay. Sorry, that's my bad. Oh, right, bad. It's my bad. <laughs> Where's yours, Fallon? You only have one pen. Where's yours? Okay. Try to do um, bad. How are you doing, Josie? Good, 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 yes. That's right, you remembered it. Okay. Okay, yes. Bad, yes, very good. Um, the daylight, make sure this side comes out a little bit further. Try bad, right bad. That looks like kind of a three a quarter of a crown. Oh yeah, tell me about it. Okay, and we're gonna write some four-letter words now. Ooh, here's a cool one. Oh, we didn't do that yet. Bath. Oh, here's a tricky one. Oh, I can't use that one yet. How about Kathy? So either do bath or do Kathy. Got one? You don't have a pen? Okay, you guys are supposed to bring note paper, a Bible, and a pen with you when you come to church.
Okay, who's got bath? <clears throat> who's got bath? You do? Let me see. No problem? Very good. Who's got Kathy? Anybody do Kathy? Let me see. That's Zayin. That's right. And yo, it's very good. Get one, Josh. Okay. This is what is that? That is a Zayin. You have Zappy. All right, Kaleo, blow them all in the water, baby. And that's, uh, okay. Uh, very good, Kathy. Pastor. Okay. Very nice. All righty. Scholars all. All righty. Here, son, can you erase that for me, please? Whoops. All right, good job. Very, very good. That's the first time you guys have been asked to apply transliteration to your letters. So that will be enough Hebrew for tonight, and we'll continue on learning our alphabet next week. One's in the beginning, one's in the middle of the word, and the final one is final um, kaf, soffit kaf. Yes, that's correct. All right, so we have been, everybody have your note sheets with you? We have been talking about New Jerusalem, and we've been talking about how there is a heavenly Jerusalem now. The reason there is a Jerusalem on earth, the reason there was ever an earthly Jerusalem, is because there was a heavenly Jerusalem. Remember, the principle is everything here on earth is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. Even man himself is a copy and a shadow, a miniature version of God himself. Remember in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, you have the Elohistic version and the Yahwistic version of creation. One, he shows himself as a powerful creator. In the second chapter, he reveals himself as a Lord who wants to build relationship with man. But nonetheless, the language is the same. And let us, God, make man in our image, in our likeness. Let us make man both male and female and give them dominion over the earth. Not only are you and I designed by God to be in His image and likeness, but ultimately His plan before we wrecked it was that we would have dominion over the earth in a very, very miniaturized, subatomic way in which He has dominion in the universe. So that is the pattern that we're following. In the middle of the desert, when Moses led the children of Israel out, God had Moses build him a sanctuary, build him a tabernacle, a mishkan. <clears throat> so uh, that, that's, that's what we are studying currently because that is what is at the heart of Jerusalem and that's what is at the heart of God's interface between himself and man. The temple, the tabernacle, is what not so much God needed to meet man, but man needed in order to interface with God. Okay? It's almost like God has Wi-Fi, but, you know, we are Ethernet only. So, although we need a connector, you know, God can grab us out of just about anywhere. All right, so take a look at your New Jerusalem 4.6. Let's start by reviewing what we know about the tabernacle. Because the tabernacle, there is an earthly tabernacle and there's a heavenly tabernacle, Exodus 25. 
The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering from me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. Now, let me touch on this before I go on. Are you and I supposed to build a temple for God? Yes. Are you and I supposed to build a tabernacle for God? Everybody say yes. yes. Where are you supposed to build this tabernacle? Is it this church? Is it CCI? That's correct. God dwells not in buildings made by human hands. That is not where God wants to build. What is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You, your body, your mind, your heart, your, your, your everything. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And either you are going to build your life as something that can hold the presence of God, or you're not. There are many people who are saved, but they do not cultivate a relationship with the Lord. How many understand what I mean? Say amen. amen. And if you are a carnal Christian, if you continue to sin it up, somebody say praise the Lord because that's the grace and the mercy of God. It doesn't matter how far you fall. This is the manner in which God has said man is going to be saved. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Let me hear it and you believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead, say amen if you do, you are saved. It is by this faith you are saved. You clean up your life, it doesn't matter. You quit doing this or quit doing that, it doesn't matter. You start doing this or you start doing that, it doesn't matter. You go church, you don't go church, doesn't matter. You give offering, you don't give offering, doesn't matter. You tithe, you don't tithe, it doesn't matter. Salvation is is no longer tied to these things. Salvation is now tied only to your faith and belief and acceptation that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on the cross to pay for your sins according to Scripture, and He rose again three days later to validate and to prove who and what He was. Can I hear an amen? amen. That's salvation. But if you want to build in your mind and your heart a life in which God's presence can dwell, then that is up to you. Again, look at the first words here in Exodus chapter 25. You and I, we're supposed to build a temple, a tabernacle for the presence of God, right? But let each man give because God says, if you don't give, I'm going to kill you. Is that what it says? Give to build this tabernacle or every single other Jew is going to ostracize you and treat you like junk. Is that what it says? Then why do you treat your brother like junk just because you judge him and feel he's not living up to your standards or God's standards? This is what God says. This is the foundation of His Word. Tell my people to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. It says so in 1 Corinthians. Let each man give as his heart prompts him to give because God loves a cheerful giver. This is not just money. This is also your time. This is also your attention. This is also your love. This is also your worship. Everything regarding what you give God, let it be because your heart prompts you to give. You are called. But not everybody's going to respond. You're saved anyway. Trust me, you are. But if you want to cultivate the relationship with Jesus, and you want to build in your mind and your heart a life where His presence comes and dwells, this is His desire. This is what He wants. I want to anoint you. I want to fill you with my Holy Spirit. I want to bless you. I want to give you power. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want you to share your life with me. And when you do that, I will share my life with you. James chapter 4, verse 8 says, Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. This is the promise of the living God who created the heavens and the earth by His mind and by His will and by His word. He wants to have a relationship with you. Then have them make me a sanctuary, a mikdash, a home for me, and I will dwell among them. I will dwell among them. I will dwell among them. He wants to dwell among you. He wants to dwell within you. 
make this tabernacle. Now, the word tabernacle, tent, mishkan, with all its furnishings, exactly like the pattern I will show you. And we find in Hebrews that he says, make it exactly as I show you, because what Moses built in, uh, in Sinai was a copying of shadow of what actually was in heaven. And this is the basic model of the tabernacle. There is an outer court, an outer fence, and then there is a gate. Then there is a brazen altar upon which sacrifices were made. Then there is a bronze laver into which people did their ritual washings. This is called a mikvah. And there's a tractate mikvah ot. Uh, in, in, the Mish, uh, in, in the Mishnah that talks about exactly how to do this and what to look for. And then here is the main tent. This is, these are five pillars. There's a tent. There are four skins covering this tent. There is a veil separating two compartments in this tent. And in this first part, there is the menorah, seventh lamp candle stand. There is a brazen altar upon which incense burned night and day. There is a table upon which there was showbread, which we described last time, bowls and goblets. And finally in here was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant contained the tablet contain the jar filled with manna, manna, and also contain the rod that sprouted, the rod of Aaron that sprouted. This is the tabernacle. This is the mishkan. When he's talking about building a mishkan, this is actually it. And last week we talked about how if we are priests, who in this room is a priest? Okay, turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, you are a priest. You are part of this royal priesthood. If there were priests that were ministering in this tabernacle, which was a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven, then you and I also have spiritual equivalents which we can accommodate now. There were people who would greet when they would come in and they would be told what was contained in here and what they would have to do and where they should go. These are witnesses that tell and explain about all of this. That is what all of us are called to do is witness. You're not necessarily called to learn the four spiritual laws. You're not necessarily called to go to Bible college and learn how to parse Greek and exegete Hebrew and uh, 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 learn how to do hermeneutics and systematic theology. But what you are charged to do, what every single believer in this room is charged to do, is to bear witness of what God has done for you, through you, in you, and with you. Everybody you know, everybody you work with, every family member you meet, and, and every family member you have around you, should hear over and over again the story of what Jesus did for you. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. And you tell them constantly over and over again what Jesus has done for you until they become so convinced that Jesus can save a wretch like me or a wretch like you that they begin to believe that he can save a wretch like them. Everybody is called to be a witness. Then these talked about the sacrifice. And Romans chapter 8 says, we no longer have to sacrifice bulls or goats or lambs because we have a sacrifice now. Who is it? Jesus. Jesus. There is no other sacrifice. There is no other name under heaven by which men shall be saved. Can I hear an amen? There's only Jesus. Allah is not going to work. Buddha is not going to work. Krishna is not going to work. No other faith system is going to work. I don't care how peaceful it makes you feel. Oh, but when I nami o renge kyo inside this shoebox, I feel so much peaceful. 
I don't give a rip. If I take a Valium, I'll feel peaceful. It doesn't mean that that is the pathway to heaven. If I take a dose, I'm going to feel like I'm in heaven for a little while. It doesn't mean I am. There is only one name under which men may be saved, and that is the name of Jesus. Jesus the Christ, the Hamashiach, the Savior, the Messiah, the Chosen, and the Anointed One. Belief that He is the Son of God. Believe that He, believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. Believe that He died and rose again. Three days later. That belief is what saved. That is the only sacrifice you need. And so the attendants around this are now modern day evangelists. After you got saved. Somebody say after. After, after you got saved. Then there was the cleansing and the washing. Somebody had to... You had to go, Jordan, you had to tell him, well, I did this, I lied about this, and exaggerated about that, and I said this, and I said that. And there were certain priests that would stand by the laver who would say, okay, you need to wash your hands, or you need to wash all the way down your arms or up your elbows, or you need to wash this, or you need to wash that. And that's how you would know what needs to be cleansed. In the modern-day New Testament church, that's pastors, that's teachers. So pastors and teachers are now the ones who show you and teach you about what you need to cleanse out of your life and how you can get closer to God. So we have witnesses, we have evangelists, we have pastors, we have teachers. But now the next step as you progress into the tabernacle and to get in the very presence of God is the entire goal. We run into a new level of exercise. The outer court, there are two kinds of, there, there are primary two kinds of ministry. Prophetic, and priestly. Prophetic, you are bringing God to man. Priestly, you are bringing man to God. Prophetic, you minister to people. Your target goal is to minister to people. Priestly, your target goal is to minister to and serve God. The two kinds of ministry, prophetic and priestly, have to do with who it serves. Prophetic, you are bringing God and the knowledge of God and the presence of God to people. That's what witnesses do. Witnesses explain God to people. Tell God about people. Evangelists explain the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to people. Teachers bring God and His wisdom to people. Pastors bring God and His love and His care and His nurturing to people. This is all people ministry. This is the prophetic role. All of these are exercises of prophetic ministry. And before you get too confused, both of these were priests. But this is a priest in his prophetic role, and this is a priest in the priestly role. So, let us talk about entering into the sanctuary. This is the Mishkan. This is the sanctuary. This is the tent. This is the tabernacle. This little two-room thing covered with badger skin and porch porpoise skin and silk. This thing is the Mishkan. Take a look here. Entering into the Mishkan. Verse 1. Now. The first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. 
A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand, table, and consecrated bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered uh, 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 Ark of the Covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, the gold tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the ato atonement cover. We cannot discuss these things in detail now. Okay, take a look at the first line. Now, the first covenant had regulations for what? Regulations for what? Regulations for what? All of these stations here that we are about to talk about have to do with what? Worship. Okay, the New Testament application of the tabernacle is worship. And that's why in this church, worship is such a big role. Because according to Scripture, all priestly ministrations are a form of what? Worship. That's why worship is so important. This is how we give to God. Now, how do we do this? Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 5. We are the new priests. You also, like living stones. How do you like the sound of that? Living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, this is the whole point to serving as a priest in the New Testament. You being a New Testament priest has to do with you being built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. You are supposed to be giving daily God spiritual sacrifices. You are supposed to be lighting the menorah. You are supposed to be burning the incense. You are supposed to be tending to the showbread and the bowl and the goblet. You are supposed to be entering into the veil. You are supposed to be tending the Ark of the Covenant. My question to you tonight is this. Number one, is this or is this not what you're supposed to be doing? So everybody say yes. How do you do it? What is this? These are all forms of worship, but what are they? And how do I engage in this? Verse 6, for in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So we are all living stones being built into a spiritual sanctuary. But the cornerstone, that is the foundation upon which it all sits, is guess who? Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. Now do you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The very thing that you don't want to believe in, the very God you don't want to believe in, the very name that you hate hearing so much, is the cornerstone, is the foundation of eternal life and is your only chance. I don't care how liberal you are and I don't care how much sense it makes to you, there's only one way to heaven and that's, the, that's through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And He's the very one they've rejected. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. How prophetic is that? This is the one that jams everybody up. Have you noticed, Fallon, that in the world, you mention the, uh, uh, the Dalai Lama, and everybody nods and goes, oh, yes, yes, he's very holy, he's very nice. And nobody wants to say anything bad about him. Nobody wants to say anything bad about Islam. Nobody wants to say anything bad about Buddhism or Hindu. There is no religion on this planet that you can smack that it's acceptable to do so. There's only two. Only two religions on this planet that you not only can smack down, but it, you're lauded and applauded for doing so. What are the two? Judaism and Christianity. Anybody notice this to be true? 
It's a rock. Jesus is a rock that makes people fall and stumble. Because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Verse 9, but man, look at this. But you are a chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people belonging to God. Why? Why? That you might gather in churches, that you might take offerings for Him, that you might build big mega churches that number 5,000 people, that you might build them TV stations and radio stations and pass out tracts and pass out DVDs and make Christian movies. Is that what we're for? Read it again, verse 9. But you, who's you? All of us. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Read it together with me. That you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. That's the whole nut. You take the shell and the whole nut is sitting right there and it's all about worship. This whole thing is all about us serving God and giving Him the glory and giving Him the praise. And that is why this church is so sold out on worship. That's why during worship, that is not the time to walk around. That's not the time to go to the bathroom unless you can help it. That's not the time to drink coffee. It's not the time to be on a device. The worship of this church or any church is the primary function of our gathering. This is not it. Listening to me yap at you. This is secondary. The most important function of this church is when we worship the Lord and pray to Him and speak to Him our praises. When the time comes to sing in the Spirit to the Lord, do not stand there with your eyes shut wondering what you're supposed to do next. What are you talking about what you're supposed to do next? You know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to close your eyes and lift your hands and engage your soul and engage your mind and begin to pour out of your mouth praises and glories to God. Don't sit there and listen to me sing. Don't watch Joshua play. He's brilliant. I get that part. But God doesn't get anything out of that, you watching Josh play. God doesn't get anything about you staying there silently. What he wants to hear is the new song coming out of your mouth, worshiping and praising him. You're chosen. You're a priesthood. You're a nation. You are a people belonging to God solely so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and do his wonderful light. Old Testament priests were all chosen. You could not just be born into any, uh, into any tribe and just decide at that point, you know what I want to be? I want to be a priest. I see the guy wearing the collar or the funny hat. I think I like that. Everybody's going to call me father or reverend. I like that. So that's what I want to do with my life. I want to be a priest. Well, guess what? You couldn't do that. Not anybody could be a priest. You had to be called by God to be a priest. You had to be chosen by God to be a priest. And in John chapter 15, 16, anybody want to tell me what Jesus said to his disciples and vicariously to you and I? Take a shot at it. It has to do with chosen. You did not... That's right. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Did not Jesus Christ say the very same thing to you and I? You did not choose me, I chose you. To do what? To declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Witnessing is great. Evangelizing is great. Pastoring and teaching is great. But if you do not declare the praises of God and have a relationship with Him and love Him and pour your adoration out to Him, then all the rest of it is meaningless. We're being formed. We're living stones. We're a holy priesthood, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. 
to give spiritual sacrifices. How? Take a look at verse 5 again. You and I also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And these are the most important three words for you to understand. Through Jesus Christ. You cannot do it alone. I don't care how good you are at playing the guitar or piano or bass, trumpet, saxophone, or drums. It is the condition of your heart and spirit that transform music into worship. You can only do this through Jesus Christ. Can the greatest musician on the face of this earth offer God praise? Yes or no? Can he? No. Can he offer him worship? No. Can he offer Kali, a spiritual sacrifice, acceptable to God? No. You can have Luciano Pavarotti, who can sing a high D, something I will never be able to do until I get to heaven. Perfect pitch. The most amazing voice in the world. But Kali, if he does not know Jesus and does not believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, he cannot praise and he cannot worship God. Not in a way that is acceptable to God. Because you can only do that through Jesus Christ. You can have the most fantastic musician on the face of this earth. But if they don't believe in Jesus, but they believe in Krishna or Buddha or Kabbalah or some other weird junk, I don't care how great they sing, I don't care how great they play, I don't care how professional they are. Any one of us croaking out, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice, it doesn't matter how it sounds. Because of your faith and because of your desire to give to God, that now becomes true praise. And I'll give you a hint that appears in heaven before the throne of God on a brazen altar that rises up as incense before him. Michael Buble singing does not rise up before him. Luciano Pavarotti singing does not rise up before him. Stanley Clark's bass playing does not rise up before him. Stevie Wonder's piano playing does not rise up before him. But Ari playing her piano. You singing off key to the Lord. You closing your eyes and lifting your hands and croaking out whatever you feel from your heart because you love God so much and you love Jesus so much. It's just got to come out and you got to say it. That appears as an incense before the throne of God and rises up before the throne in heaven as a pleasing aroma that blesses God because these things you offered Him through Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you every single one of these pillars has meaning. This menorah has meaning. This brazen altar has meaning. This bread, this bowl, this goblet, and that ark especially has meaning. And even as I shared with you the incense of this brazen altar rising up, are your prayers and your worship and your songs, every single one of these has to do with worship that you give God right here, right now, tonight. You want to know about this? Come next Wednesday. As we continue to study... The New Jerusalem. I want you to pray right now. And I want you to tell the Lord that you want to surrender your life anew and afresh to Him in a new way. Maybe you never knew. Maybe you never were taught how important worship is. How important singing these stupid songs and raising your hands 
and speaking to the Lord and telling Him how much you love Him is, how much it means. But friend, it is everything. It is the whole point to ministry. It is the foundation of all things prophetic as what God desires from us. Come worship team. Can you turn everything on, Matt? Sunday.